Welcome to Castro in the Classroom. Um, as you already know, we're going to talk about just the basic concepts of special relativity today. Um, and I think you indicated before that you hadn't done this unit yet, so I hope that this will help your understanding of this uh, sort of weird and wonderful topic as you, I guess, do it formally um, as a unit, hopefully soon. I finished my PhD, um, which for those of you who don't know is a sort of just like a massive research project. Um, lasted about three and a half years. I finished that last year and that was all about dark matter. Uh, and now I'm actually working as a postdoc, basically a, a researcher, um, at Curtin University in Perth. And I'm working on detecting the very first stars and galaxies uh, in the universe um, with, a, with a massive radio telescope in, in Outback WA. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a part of CASTRO, which is the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for All Sky Astrophysics. Basically, it's a centre of, of, of scientists who are working to uncover some of the, the biggest mysteries in the universe, like, you know, how did the universe form, how is it changing, um, and, and what the heck are these mysterious dark matter and dark energy that seem to be everywhere we look. Um, okay, so let's get on with the topic for today, uh, special relativity. Um, so we're going to start off with some history because um, I think that's important. So if you look up on the interwebs about you know, special relativity, you'll see that the history is often posed as sort of Einstein versus Newton. So 330 years ago, we had Newton, who was, who was really a ridiculous genius, who developed the laws of gravity and motion uh, that you would already know and love. Uh, then along comes Einstein in 1905, <coughs> who, who published four papers in that year alone, actually. And one of those papers outlined special relativity, which is a theory that supersedes uh, Newton's theories um, in, se in several ways. Um, by the way, one of the other papers that he published that year actually won the Nobel Prize in physics. So he's a pretty busy boy. Um, so we have this, you know, Einstein versus Newton thing, right? Well, I think the truth uh, is a little bit more mundane, but um, as is often the case, a whole lot more helpful. Um, you see, at sort of the speeds that we're generally accustomed to, and anything that Newton would have known about at slowish speeds, um, special relativity exa uh, predicts exactly what Newton said. Uh, it's exactly the same. It only predicts uh, different behavior when you move to speeds that are sort of, well, very fast, um, outside our, uh, generally in, in, our range of intuition. Uh, and so, Rather than um, Einstein sort of defeating Newton in some grand physics battle, actually all he did was extend the theory of Newton uh, in, in an extreme regime, albeit in a, in a very fundamental and bizarre way. Uh, and that's exactly how science works, and I think that's very important to realise. So theories aren't overthrown overnight by some genius discovery. Uh, rather, they are extended uh, here and there um, by researchers building upon previous research. Um, Newton himself said that uh, his own research and his own di uh, discoveries were gained by standing on the shoulders of the giants before him. And I think we shouldn't be too surprised if, if one day uh, we, it turns out that special relativity itself uh, turns out to be not completely correct in some regime, in, in some extreme case. In, in some extreme case. Uh, so the other thing to keep in mind is that there are lots of scientists in the 50 years or so before Einstein that paved the way for his discoveries. Uh, people like Maxwell and Lorentz, and in particular, uh, Michelson and Morley, who did a very influential experiment around, around that time, which I'm sure you'll, you'll learn in more detail than I can present today. So what did that experiment uh, try to uncover? Well, uh, there had been a lot of research in sort of the 1900s uh, saying that light behaves as a wave, uh, just like an ocean wave. Uh, you know, when you've got ocean waves, they can interfere, they can um, interact so that they build, one each other, uh, build each other up or they can cancel each other out. And uh, light was shown to behave in much the same way. Uh, and, uh, but, but of course, all the other waves that we know about uh, have to travel through something, whether it's through water or whether it's through air, like a, like a sound wave. Everything travels through something called a medium. And so people expected, so sci scientists expected that light would uh, behave in the same way, it would have to have a medium to travel through. And this hypothetical medium they called the ether. 
So Mickelson Morley uh, constructed an experiment to deduce the motion of this ether uh, with respect to the Earth. So basically what they did is they got some mirrors and lasers and they measured the speed of light in perpendicular directions, like you, you can see on the screen there, uh, on Earth, as the Earth rotated and orbited around the Sun. So they measured it at all different angles with respect to whatever ether uh, was out there. Uh, and what they expected was that the speed of light that they measured would be different as, as the Earth rotated and orbited around the Sun. But what they actually found was that the speed of light was the same in all directions. Now, when I first learned about this, I kind of thought, yeah, well, big deal. Of course, the speed of light's the same in all directions. That just makes sense. Uh, but let me try to illustrate why uh, scientists actually found this quite surprising. So imagine uh, we've got a river. Right, so we've got a river and we've got a boat and, and on the left uh, of the screen we have uh, a river that's not moving and the boat's moving from left to right and on, on the right we have a river that's moving downstream towards um, the bottom of the screen. And uh, so the, the boat creates a wake, right? so the, the wake travels in waves um, from the back of the boat, you would have all seen this. Um, and we can predict that the wake will be symmetrical uh, with respect to where the boat is. So it'll travel out symmetrically up and down because the waves themselves travel through the medium, the water, at the same speed. But of course, if the river is moving, uh, what we expect to see is an asymmetric pattern. So we expect, uh, even though the waves are moving with the same rate through the water, because the water is also moving, uh, we expect the wave to see the waves move down faster than they move up. So the mickelson morley experiment was kind of like trying to measure the speed of the flow of the river by measuring the wake coming from the back of a boat. But instead of finding it being asymmetrical, they found it to be symmetrical no matter how fast the river was moving. And that was very surprising and it made people step back and say, oh, what the heck's going on? Where's the ether? Um, and they didn't necessarily abandon the idea of an ether overnight because, as we said, science doesn't work that way. Um, but it did place the ether on very shaky ground uh, and people were you know, really asking these questions. And that's, the, that's where Einstein came in. So he wasn't necessarily trying to explicitly solve the Michelson-Morley problem, um, but that was one of the background reasons for his work. Uh, his theory, however, did give a physical reason why the Michelson-Morley experiment worked out the way that it did. Um, and, and in doing so, it actually ruled out the ether model completely. So his theory of special relativity uh, actually really comes down to two uh, reasonably simple postulates or uh, sort of statements that he posed as being true. Uh, and from these two postulates, a whole heap of other implications come out um, that are really quite bizarre. So the first postulate is the principle of relativity and this says that the laws of physics are the same in every inertial reference frame. Uh, and the second one says that the speed of light in a vacuum is the same in all inertial reference frames regardless of the motion of the source of that light. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll go through each of these uh, postulates in turn and, and see what they mean and then we'll go through some of the implications of, of you know, what comes out of those things. But first there's actually a very important concept that we need to, to look at and that is uh, reference frames. Uh, so these were actually mentioned in both of those postulates so they're obviously quite important. Uh, so what are they? Well actually they're really a simple concept. Uh, they're just floating coordinate systems. It's kind of like a, a 3D uh, sort of set of axes floating around in space. Nothing too weird. Um, but to understand it more intuitively perhaps it's helpful to imagine as you see on the screen a game of footy. Right? So um, imagine a 3D set of axes sitting on everyone's head. It's moving with the, with the player as, as he moves around. We could say, for instance, the guy with the ball, I don't know if you can know if you can see the guy with the ball, but anyway, the guy with the ball, say he's running at five meters per second. Um, we've actually made an assumption in saying that, and I wonder if anyone can think of what that assumption would be. Well, what we did was we assumed that there is another coordinate system that's attached to the ground. Right? So this one's actually especially helpful because it's actually literally painted onto the ground for us. Um, and, and so we usually ignore this one. We just uh, take it for granted. Um, but in special relativity, we have to learn to say that the player is moving, say, at five meters per second with respect to the ground. Because if we look at it from a different perspective, um, you know, from space, he's actually hurtling through space at hundreds of k's an hour. Um, 
but more more of importance to to the player of course is that the defender himself who we might say is moving at five meters per, se uh, per second in the other direction with respect to the ground um, though he's moving with five meters per second with respect to the ground he's moving at 10 meters per second with respect to the player with the ball uh, which is going to hurt more when he gets hit so we have to get used to this idea that all velocities, all speeds and positions have to be defined with respect to some coordinate system. We have to define the frame of reference before we know what the other velocities uh, and, and positions are. And we sort of know this, but we have to get used to that fact that there's always this one that we take for granted usually. Okay, so the, uh, the other thing worth noting is that the postulates both talk about inertial reference frame. So what does this word inertial mean? Well, it's, it literally just means moving with inertia only, which means it's not accelerating. Uh, so that means that rockets don't apply. Uh, so special relativity doesn't apply to rockets taking off uh, from the ground, or it doesn't even apply to merry-go-rounds because of the centripetal acceleration. Uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity, which is a much more advanced, uh, deals with these accelerating reference frames, but his special relativity uh, deals with the special case of non-accelerating reference frames. Okay, so let's go back to that first postulate and see what it means. So it's the principle of relativity and it says that the laws of physics are the same in every inertial reference frame. So at first glance this seems yeah, pretty obvious. Uh, this should be true, but just let's just think of what that really implies. Okay, so if we're sitting there and uh, we have a ball in our hand, uh, we're sitting still with respect to the ground, uh, and we throw the ball up, what happens? Right? The ball comes straight back down. Cool. Everyone knows that. Uh, Newton predicted that. All good. Okay, but let's let's assume we're now sitting in a car, and the car is moving with a constant speed with respect to the road. Right? Again, we're sitting in the car and we throw the ball straight up. What happens? Well, again, the ball comes straight back down. From our perspective, all the ball does is go up and come back down just like it did when we were sitting still. But of course, to some guy sitting outside, uh, for some reason watching through the window of your car as you're driving along, um, the, the ball actually doesn't go straight up and down. It travels in a parabola. Um, and Newton's laws also predict this type of motion, right? So the physics works the same in both reference frames, but what it actually looks like is different. And the implication of all this actually is that, is this simple statement, you can't tell if you're moving. There's literally no experiment that you can design which can tell you if you are moving or at rest. Any, any experiment you can do, uh, you can define such that everything else is moving and you're sitting still and the, the equations all work out and everything makes sense. So that's uh, quite interesting. Now if you want to uh, look for a look at a, a sort of a neat demonstration of this sort of ball throwing in a parabola thing, um, look at this YouTube link. Someone does this on a, on a skateboard and shows the, the ball moving. Um, it's kind of neat. Okay, so the second postulate is the speed of light in vacuum is the same in all inertial reference frames regardless of the motion of the source. Okay, so to understand this, let's think of a spaceship flying through space and we've got Einstein sitting on the Earth watching it. Uh, and in this illustration, let's assume for convenience that the Earth is not rotating, it's sort of just sitting there, right? He's not accelerating. And so the, the rocket's flying through space at 1,000 metres per second and it shoots a missile at, uh, at 2,000 metres per second. So how do we, what, what, what speed does Einstein see that missile traveling at? Well, the answer is quite easy. You just add up the 1,000 meters per second and the 2,000 meters per second to get 3,000 meters per second. That's all you know, quite fine within uh, the sort of Newtonian equations. Okay, but let's change that a little bit. So now the spaceship, instead of shooting a missile, shoots a laser beam. So you might be tempted to think that either the spaceship sees the light going slower than the speed of light c because it's sort of catching up to the light. Or maybe you might think that Einstein sees the light going faster than the speed of light c. Or you might think it's a, a little bit of both, right? So that's, that's the way we tend to intuitively think. But what Einstein's postulate here says is that both the spaceship and himself sitting on Earth stationary uh, see the light traveling at exactly the same speed, c. So he said that the speed of light in vacuum is exactly the speed of light always in every direction for every observer. 
But then how does that work? All right. Well, the reason that it's intuitively difficult uh, to understand how this works is because we expect that times and distances are set in stone for everyone at all places. And that's what makes the light, what makes us think that the light should be relative uh, to, to each person. But if, if we take uh, as a law that the light is the same in every frame of reference, then perhaps times and distances are not set in stone anymore. Perhaps they are relative. And that's what we're going to work out through uh, the rest of this talk. So Einstein usually um, talked about these things in terms of thought experiments, and we're going to do the same. Uh, so I'm going to introduce to you a very, very fast train, and Alice on the train uh, who's carrying some pretty neat laser equipment, and Bob who's standing on the platform watching. OK, so we expect that if two things happen at the same time at different places, according to one person, then according to a different person, those two things also happen at the same time. That's sort of the, you know, simultaneity. It's the principle of simultaneity. However, special relativity actually does away with this. And we can see this um, by the following example. Imagine Alice is standing smack bang in the middle of her carriage. Uh, so you can see in, in, the, in the diagram, you know, the dot right in the middle of her carriage. And she sends out a, a, a beam of light in both directions, a flash of light in both directions. And she's got detectors uh, situated at the ends of her carriage. Right, and now notice I haven't said whether she's moving, whether the carriage is moving at all, because according to the first postulate, she can't tell. She can't tell if she's moving. So according to that postulate, and because the speed of light is the same in all directions, the light hits the ends of the train exactly at the same time. It must. OK, that's, that makes sense. But imagine Bob is viewing it from the platform. And what he sees is that Alice is actually traveling fast at some prodigious rate right, um, past him on, on the train tracks. And again, she lets out this flash uh, right in the middle of the train just as she passes Bob. Uh, but of course to Bob, the, the distance between the back of the train and the, and the light pulse is decreasing with time because the train is going forward. So the light, the light pulse to his perspective reaches the back of the train before it reaches the front of the train. So something that happened at the same time in Alice's frame of reference happens at a different time in Bob's frame of reference. So simultaneity has actually become relative to the frame of reference that we're in. And this actually happens for other things as well, like time, length, and even mass, which we won't have time to, to get into today. So let's have a look at time. So, okay, let's assume that, uh, that Alice now takes one of those detectors from the end of the train and she puts it on the floor. Then she gets a mirror and puts it on the top of the train, right? And she gets her laser, she sticks it next to the, the detector, sets it off, the light goes up, hits the top of the train, bounces back off the mirror, and goes into the detector. How long does that journey take? Right, so the light has traveled. We know how tall the train is, does that say a, a, a distance L? And so the, the light travels two times L, and it's traveling at a speed C, so the time it takes is two L on C. Really easy. Remember again, Alice can't tell if she's moving, so that's just what it is. She shoots it up, and it comes back down. It takes two L on C, but again, Bob is watching from the platform. And as he's watching, the train is moving from left to right. Uh, and so at, uh, when, when Alice releases the, the flash of light, uh, the, the train is in that first position uh, on the left of this, the second diagram. And uh, by the time it hits the top mirror, the train has moved to the right a bit. And then by the hit time it hits the, the, the bottom detector, it's moved to the right a bit more. So the light's actually traveled in a diagonal path. So we can actually figure out what that length d is. So the light has traveled a distance of 2d, um, and again, it's going the same rate, c, so the time it takes must be 2d on c. And we can measure that length d just using Pythagoras' theorem, which you should all know. So just using that theorem, and you should, you should be able to do this yourself, you can show that the time that Bob measures is the same as the time that Alice measures divided by this factor, square root of 1 minus v squared on c squared, where v is the speed of the train and c is the speed of light. And we call this time dilation because that factor on the bottom is always smaller than one. And so TB is always greater than TA. Uh, so Bob actually sees Alice's clock running slow and that's time dilation. Now Bob and Alice want to see how distances stack up. 
right? So um, Alice can easily measure the time, um, well, can easily measure the length of her carriage by starting her watch when the front hits, you know, hits where Bob is and then hitting it again when uh, the back hits Bob. So she measures, you know, TA and she knows the velocity of the train so she can measure the length by those multiplied by each other. But Bob can also do the same thing. Uh, but they're going to get different answers because their times, as we just saw, are different. And so when we plug those numbers in, we get that Bob's length, measured length, is the same as Alice's length multiplied by that same factor. We call this length contraction because again, the square root is always less than one. And so Bob's length is always smaller than Alice's length. Interestingly enough, of course, Alice looks at Bob's platform and she sees that as smaller than what Bob sees it. So they both uh, see the lengths contracted. So in the end, there are no true times or lengths. Uh, that's, that's the takeaway, takeaway thing. Every time or length must be defined in the context of a reference frame. They don't exist outside that. Okay, uh, this is a real experiment. We don't have much time to go through it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip this example um, because uh, you can see down the bottom there's actually an animation online which will, will show you all about this example. It's done by Castro. So if you look up Castro Muon Decay, it will go through this example. I don't have time to go through it now, um, but it's actually a really helpful example to look at. Um, and it will show you how things work out from both frames of reference uh, in terms of the physical results. So just quickly to, to sort of finish up, so some of the other implications of uh, special relativity. So we've talked about time and we've talked about length, um, but there are other things that change as well. So one of the important ones is the momentum, uh, which is basically the mass of an object increases when the velocity increases. So that's according to this equation that you can see uh, on the slide now. It's the same factor there. And this actually is the reason that you might have heard that special relativity predicts that nothing can be accelerated past the speed of light. Uh, you can see if V goes to, well, it becomes close to C in the equation, then you get one minus one on the, on the denominator, which you know, is close to zero, which means that MV, the, the, the mass of the object in the moving frame goes to infinity. And so it takes an infinite amount of energy to accelerate it any further. And so you can't, in, you can't accelerate past the speed of light. Another implication of this uh, actually is that the energy of, 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 a, of an object sitting still is not zero. It's uh, given by the famous equation that energy equals m, uh, the mass times the speed of light squared. We don't have time to derive that today, but uh, you can look that up as well. Um, it's a pretty cool uh, implication. Uh, a couple of other ones is that viewing angles are distorted at high velocity. Uh, and also there's a relativistic Doppler shift. So you would have probably heard of the Doppler shift of sound. Uh, well, there's also a relativistic Doppler shift of light waves. Uh, and also the searchlight effect is where if you're traveling towards a light source, the intensity of that light source increases. Um, and just to plug this, the, the, there's a really cool little game actually uh, developed by MIT. It's called the slower speed of light and inbuilt to the physics of that game uh, is special relativity. So as you move around, uh, you can move around close to the speed of light and uh, everything looks like it should do uh, if special relativity were true. So you can get a kind of cool intuitive understanding of what's happening. Uh, so you can get that for free online. Um, just to finish up, uh, a couple of general tips um, and then we can have some questions. So, uh, one, understanding the concepts of special relativity is, is quite tricky. The maths is easy, the, the concepts are quite tricky. And I think the, the biggest thing to remember is that there is no special absolute frame. Remember when we were talking about with the football that um, it's, it's easy to take one for granted. And you have to learn not to do that, to tell yourself that there is no special frame, everything's relative to something else. Uh, another way to, to really get a good understanding of the special relativity is to work through some of the apparent paradoxes. Uh, so examples of these are the twin paradox, uh, the pole and barn paradox, and you can look these up on the internet. Um, if you can master these, these sort of highlight the most counterintuitive parts of special relativity. If you can understand these, then you'll be doing really well in understanding special relativity itself. And uh, finally, the, the most easiest mistake to make is to confuse reference frames. So um, for instance, the, the equations for time dilation are usually given in terms of T sub V, which is the moving frame, and T naught, which is the stationary frame. But which one is moving, right? Uh, the, the true answer is that both of them are moving with respect to each other. 
Uh, okay, so which ones are dilated? Well, again, both of them are with respect to each other. Both times are dilated. Uh, the, the trick is to, to know which frame the question that you are working on is asking about. And to do that, you sort of have to have a good understanding of what's going on. Uh, so remember that. But uh, I guess as a final thing, uh, to make it easier, moving clocks run slow, moving rods are shorter, and moving bodies are heavier. If you remember those three, uh, you'll be doing pretty well. Uh, so that's all I've got time for today. Um, please ask questions. Um, but other than that, that's bye from me, Alice, and Bob. So thank you very much.